says we're ready to go. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, on these, uh, you know, few days before for, before Christmas, you would never know uh, looking outside at the the sun and uh, warm weather. Um, my name is Laura Groob. I'm an associate professor at Beloit College um, in the economics department. I've been working with emeritus professor Jeff Adams and also. Uh, Nick Damasis to put together this series that's entitled Know Your Local Government. Um, I'm going to kind of keep this short, but um, you know, give you a heads up that this project is really inspired by the property tax bill, which when we met last month, I don't think we had received our property tax bills quite yet. Um, but the, the idea is to think about those taxing jurisdictions, so that would be uh, city of Beloit um, today. Of course, we have Black Hawk Technical College, School District of Beloit, and Rock County. And to ask those different entities, what is your budget? We know kind of where some of this money comes from through the property tax bill. Um, what are other sources of revenues for those entities? And then importantly, how is that money used? Uh, so that is our, our primary motivation understanding uh, property tax bills and uh, public finance. So today we have uh, Jim Nemeth, uh, who is the Vice President for Finance and Operations at Black Hawk Technical uh, College. We are thrilled to have him. Um, Jim is new in this role, but has been involved with Black Hawk for a number of years. Um, so thank you for taking the time. And before we hand it over, just to remind folks that next month, January 17th, we have Sherry Oja, who's the Finance Director of Rock County, will be joining us. And so that Nick uh, is not concerned, thank you so much to the State Line Community Foundation for sponsoring this series and specifically for providing lunches. Jim. Well, thank you everybody uh, for coming out today, and I, I really appreciate any chance I get to give a talk. I'm not great standing behind podium, so hopefully you can hear me okay with the lapel mic. I believe it is on and working. So, uh, as uh, Laura shared, uh, my name is Jim Nemeth. I am the uh, Vice President of Finance and College Operations uh, for Blackhawk Technical College. I started in July. Um, I actually came from a background in nonprofit healthcare. Uh, but education has always been a uh, passion of mine. I've been on the foundation board at Blackhawk for almost 12 years, and then about three years ago, I started teaching an accounting one class uh, at night. So I've been one of their adjunct professors, uh, and I've continued to do that uh, at this semester. I continued even uh, after assuming my new role at the college. So it is something that I do have a lot of passion for. I think we do a lot of good things uh, at Blackhawk Technical College. I'll share a few of those today. I'll also get into some of the, uh, the, the dollars and cents as well. As I go through the presentation, if there's questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm more than happy um, to take a question throughout. Otherwise, um, at the end, we'll have time as well um, to answer any questions you have. Okay. So Blackhawk Technical College is uh, one of 16 technical colleges in the state of Wisconsin. We make up the Wisconsin Technical College System. Uh, so we are separate from the UW system. We have our own uh, technical college system. Blackhawk uh, makes up all of Rock County and almost all of Greene County. There's a couple small municipalities kind of on the northeast corner that are actually in the Madison um, uh, uh, Technical College District. We are, by geography and population, one of the smallest of the districts. Um, so we don't have a large geography and, and we also, our population um, is one of the smaller uh, throughout the state. So I thought I'd start with our mission vision and values um, at the college. Our mission is, and make sure I get the wording right, I haven't been there long enough to have it perfectly memorized, I'm getting better at it, uh, but we help you build your future with flexible education and a supportive environment. And those are two things that you'll see as a theme as we get into our strategic plan uh, is very important to us. Uh, we wanna make sure we have both a flexible environment so the students can come to us uh, and all points in their life uh, with all sorts of different things that go on outside of just school and we can still provide that and we want to be supportive of their needs, make sure that they can have success. Our vision is delivering innovative education to enrich our communities and our six values, our responsiveness, 
um, collaborative, um, collaborative, empowering, strategic, process-driven, and inclusion. So a few years back, uh, we went through a strategic planning process. We developed these five strategic um, areas that we we're going to focus in on, and we put tactics to all those areas. Uh, we've been making a lot of progress on our strategic plan um, as we've gone through the years, and we're getting to the point where we're going to be refreshing our plan here very soon. Uh, this year, we're going to be looking at our Monroe campus as kind of a smaller portion of our strategic plan, really focusing on our Monroe campus. We've engaged a consultant to help us with that process. And then we'll be looking at um, in fiscal 25, so we're a July to June fiscal year, so in our fiscal 25 that starts next June or next July, uh, we're looking at doing a strategic plan, a refresh of our strategic plan for the entire organization. When we go through our strategic plan areas, uh, as you saw in our mission, flexible education is a big part of our goal. Um, and we've done that, and really some of this strategic plan got in place before COVID, which was great. One of the big things about flexible education is where you receive the education. Is it in person? Um, is it online live? Or is it online entirely? Uh, we rolled out something we call My Ed Choice, where students have the opportunity to do any one of those options uh, for their education. So the, the class I teach, I have students that show up in person, I have students that are on uh, uh, Zoom is what we use, uh, uh, and they, I can see them and I can interact with them, and I have students that don't interact, they just watch the video later, um, and then do the class completely as an online class. Uh, we started rolling that out, and when COVID hit, it helped us accelerate that process. We were a little ahead of the curve, um, but providing that flexible education. But we mean more than just where you get that education. In our math division, we've been working a lot on flexible scheduling. So how do they take their classes? Is it you take all four classes throughout the 16 weeks or five classes throughout the 16 weeks? Or do you, hey, I have this lab I do for the first three weeks, this lab I do for the next three weeks, um, and so forth. And by breaking it down into those smaller components, it allows people to start when they can. Not everyone can start necessarily on now, August 19th is when, and when our fall semester starts next year. Not everyone can start there. So what if you start and come in October? Well, before it'd be, nope, you gotta wait till next semester. Now we can get people going uh, in that division in October and get them moving right away when they're ready to start learning rather than when we're ready to start teaching them. We also look at how we have our associate's degrees. How can they translate into moving on to a university if somebody wants to go on for their bachelor's degree? How do we make that as flexible um, as possible? And I'll talk a little bit about our university center later on. Uh, but that's another way we look at flexible education. So I think that's one of the big areas that we've made a lot of progress and we're very proud of at the college. Talk about educational excellence. We've done a lot in terms of our course um, research, making sure we're doing the best practices and also faculty education, making sure they're being uh, both educated and um, evaluated so that they're providing the best education to our students that we can. When we talk data-driven, you know, the first thing with any data-driven is make sure you get accurate and consistent data. That was always a challenge. You have multiple systems, trying to bring all those systems together. We've made a lot of progress there. And then really we've transitioned to the second part, which is how do we get that information in front of the decision makers? How do I get that information when I'm making decisions in the areas that I'm responsible for so we can make good decisions on what we're doing um, uh, moving forward? And we've made a lot of progress there. From a college environment, well, that encompasses a lot. We want to be an inclusive environment. We want to be a supportive environment. And that supportive part, we've spent a lot of energy on as we've hired additional uh, advisors so that when a student comes to us, they're able to uh, be helped through the process. If they have questions, there's somebody there to help them through. But also things like our care center, where if a student has an emergency need, uh, they don't have food. Well, obviously, education is going to come secondary uh, to that. Oops, this went off again. It comes secondary to that um, uh, if they don't have. Uh, uh, if they don't have uh, food on the table. So how do we help support them in those ways? We have emergency funding, if somebody's car breaks down, and it's, hey, it's tuition or paying for the car payment. And we work with our foundation as well a lot in that area. Um, and then uh, operational effectiveness, obviously we wanna make sure we're spending uh, the dollars we receive um, from uh, various taxing locations uh, that we're spending those efficiently and effectively. Uh, one thing we've worked out a lot is our scheduling process, really making that a much more automated process so we don't have as much manual intervention, reducing the cost of that process, but also um, really looking at our budgeting process. We recently implemented a new 
uh, budgeting planning tool, and that's something I'm excited to go through my first process. We just kind of kicked off our budget and looking through my first process so I can bring some things I've learned from my nonprofit healthcare, hopefully, to the college and, and continue to enhance that. Jim? Yes. Would you just know, are, are you going to talk about the implications of the flexible learning things you talked about and the, their impact on the facility decisions at some point? I can. Uh, we, we can bring that up, and actually, I can talk about that now. Um, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, for the flexible learning, uh, one thing it has allowed us to do um, is oftentimes teach more classes in less space. So we'll be able to more effectively use some of our spaces. I think though the biggest thing we've seen is um, we're working on how do we get students to choose the um, live um, option. And so, when we talk about uh, our three options, we want to be flexible. We have students that are too far away to come to campus. We have students that, for whatever reason, are not able to come into campus on a regular basis. But what we've really been focusing on as a facility is how do we make um, the option to come onto campus as um, positive of an option as possible. All the data, all the research has said people who take their learning in person are far more likely to succeed than somebody who's doing it solely online. And as, although we're trying to close that gap, I think the key for us is how do we make our campuses um, the most inviting and most um, uh, uh, most helpful for students to choose to come to a campus. So one of the projects we worked on was our commons area, really making a nice commons area that we opened up a couple years ago and say, how do we make that? Another thing has been as we're uh, looking at, and I'll talk about construction updates later, you know, we were improving our um, uh, public safety um, buildings, and we did that a few years back, but now we're able to bring our innovative manufacturing center onto campus. Having more at campus will help drive more students there um, and have that college environment. Because if you show up and you're one of three, and I've seen this in my classes, when I show up, and at the first class I only have one person show up live and two people online, by the end of the semester I'm teaching almost all online. But if I have six or seven in person, those six or seven kind of create a little cohort and they come every day and I have that consistent people. So I think it definitely has impacted it. Our parking lot's not as full as it was you know, pre-pandemic, uh, but what I think as we're looking at it is now we have to up our game from a facility standpoint to make that environment as um, conducive and inclusive as possible so we get students there so that they can learn at what we believe is the best learning environment. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. start. Okay. Well, there's more free stuff. So, so yeah. we're just about. Yeah. Then, how's that working out for you? Are you guys? Are this semester, uh, we've seen pretty consistent. It's still a little anecdotal. Um, we have to look at how we're going to measure that. I think a little bit more. But anecdotally, we've seen, and I saw it in my class, and I know other faculty have seen it in their class. We've seen an increase in people coming live onto campus, and I think that the combination of a couple years past COVID has helped. You know, I don't think there's as much fear as there were as it was a few years ago. Uh, but I also think the things we've been doing to encourage that on campus, um, um, people to come on campus has been working. So I know I've seen it in my personal class. Uh, I have one of the largest ones I've had since the first semester I taught. And I know other, uh, other faculty anecdotally have said the same thing. They are seeing more. And just from, a, I'll use the parking lot analogy, from what I see in the parking lot, we've definitely seen a, a stronger um, number of students actually coming onto campus. So I, I think we have seen progress there, um, and that's an area we, as, as Dr. Pierner always says, uh, we, we can't make people come, come to campus, we have to get them to choose to come to campus. So I think that's the key about how we're approaching it. Okay, so the financial side of things, our property taxes. Um, so. For the uh, residents of the city of Beloit, uh, Blackhawk Tech makes up about 5.5% of your property tax bill. Um, so we are one of the smaller of the taxing uh, entities. The city of Beloit overall is about 13.5% of the equalized value in our district. So if you take all of Rock County and the majority of Green County, about 13.5% of that equalized value comes from um, uh, the city of Beloit. Um, so that's the, the share of the, the local taxes um, that we we charge in fiscal 24 actually for the tax bill you're about to get actually was out there online i saw they they are accessible online even though we haven't gotten in the mail i have seen them online um, our mail rate is is 0.78 
2.30, which is about $78,000 or $78.23 per $100,000 in equalized value. So it gives you an idea. I looked at the, uh, at the average value of a home in Beloit. I think I've seen different numbers, but somewhere in that $150,000 to $160,000 range. So the average taxpayer is probably seeing a bill uh, from um, Blackhawk in about a, you know, the $110, $120 range is what we're seeing. So, uh, where does our levy come from? There's really two parts to our levy. Uh, we have our operational component and our um, debt service component. So the operational component of our tax levy um, is uh, limited in its growth by the net new um, construction in our district. So that was the law passed you know, 10, 11 years ago now. Uh, the only increase we can do in our operational levy without a referendum is consistent with net new construction. This year for our overall district, we had about 2% net new construction, actually a little bit on the higher side. Um, we don't expect it to be quite as strong with the interest rates going up and those sorts of things as we move forward next year. Um, but that is the limit of what we can do on the operational side of things without a referendum. On the debt service side, um, that's the other piece of our levy. So any bonds that we take out, um, whether they're bonds for remodeling projects at the college, or we did pass that referendum back in 2020. Um, the district was uh, gracious enough to pass that for our public safety training center. Um, any borrowing related to that. Uh, very consistent with where we were last year, about 45% of our levy is the operational, and about 55% is the uh, debt service, um, which is our principal interest payments that we'll make in 2024. So how do we spend it? At the college, we have lots of different funds, so we kind of break it into our operational and then all the funds combined. I'll talk about what those other funds are that we have, but the operational is really what um, we think of the most. That's our day-to-day, -day. that's what we're, we're uh, you know, our day-to-day -day operations. Um, uh, it's our general fund and what we call our special revenue fund, which is things like grant funding that we receive. So you'll see from the operational side, um, our local, that's the property taxes, is about 7.4 million um, uh, is what we get from our property taxes throughout the district. Uh, state aid is a very large component of this, almost 15 million comes from state aid. A large portion of that is what they call um, the property tax relief that's been done over the last number of years where they offset our property taxes dollar for dollar with state aid. Um, that's about 10 million of that state aid. And the other three to four million is based on the size of the college, about. Two million is based on the size of the college, and about another million is based on the performance. So how we do as a college compared to our peer um, technical college system. So about two thirds of it is um, based on just kind of our allocated share, of number of students, our size of the college, and the other third is based on how we perform, and they have various measures that they, they uh, measure us on. So that's our state aid component. You'll see tuition is the third largest area, and that's about $7 million in tuition. Uh, there's a small federal component that's mainly grants, about 700,000. And then that institutional, so that institutional is made up of a couple different things. I, I kind of like calling it the miscellaneous revenue, but a large portion of it is what we do for what we call the non-credit classes. So like truck driving is the easiest example. We have our workforce development um, uh, department. Truck driving is one of the things they teach. Well, there's no, you ultimately get your CDL at the end of it, but we don't give credit for our truck driving class, but there's a fee associated with that. All those programs are run like that. They're very specific to an industry. That, that's our workforce development area, and that falls in institutional revenue. Um, and then other miscellaneous revenues, like interest, for example, falls in there. Historically, we almost had nothing. Now that line has grown quite a bit. I'm sure others have seen that as well. You know, we've seen some, some nice interest revenue to help fund some operations. We don't count on that as a long-term thing. We expect eventually it'll go right back down, but I have no idea. I, I tell people I will not product, predict interest. Uh, in total, our budget uh, on operations side is about $32.5 million. So then when we look at all funds, we bring in various other funds. And I'll tell you the big difference between our operational and all, there's really two things that, that make the difference. One is on the revenue side, is you'll see the federal went from 700,000 to almost 7.7 .7 million. That's all, um, uh, financial, or almost all, financial aid. So when our students get financial aid, it actually comes to us as revenue. 
and then we, and then we, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm hearing a reverb, so. Like, um, it, it comes to us as revenue, and then we pay it right out to the student. It's a complete pass through the, the matching expense. So there's no dollars that we keep of the financial aid. The other thing is you'll see the local um, went from seven to about 17. That additional amount is the um, debt service that we have. So that's that portion of the levy that's our debt service. It's about $10 million, actually under $10 million, about 9.6 million for debt service for next year. So where do we spend the money? Um, as a college, I'm glad to report we spend most of it on our students, um, and that's what we like to see. Um, you can see on the instructional, um, we spend almost 18 million, 55% of our budget on our students. Um, student services is another big item, about three and a half million. So if you just take those two combined, almost two thirds of the dollars we receive are directly going to serving our students. We then have a small portion, about 1.4 million in instructional support. And these are the folks that are really there. Um, uh, it might be the dean of the college. It's the um, we have this department called CEDL, which does all of like, okay, how do we make sure our classes are being um, built correctly in our in our learning management tool? How do we make sure we're training our faculty? So that's what we call instructional support. Uh, kind of those folks that are really making sure our instructors are getting what they need so they can provide good education. We have the general institutional. Um, so this includes lots of different things, but it includes things like our um, IT department, that's a large portion of that budget is our IT department, um, our accounting, um, all those things that are the, the back um, portion, uh, the kind of back office functions. And the physical plan is the actual heating and cooling of our facilities, the maintaining of our facilities um, uh, is that physical plan component. So that's how those dollars are, are being spent. It's about 32 and a half million as well. We run a pretty balanced budget um, and that's, our goal is to be as efficient as possible, to stay within our revenue constraints. And then we look at all funds again, um, uh, just how we do accounting and government. If, uh, for those of you who are in the private industry, uh, we always look at it differently, but when we do construction for things like physical plant, it shows up as an expenditure. We don't, it doesn't show up uh, as a capital purchase and depreciate over time. That's not how we do it. Um, so physical plant, that's really, um, the reason it grew from almost 3 million to 19 million, that's been the construction we've been doing. This year has been an unusually large year for our budget next year because we have all of the, um, uh, um, the uh, Innovative Manufacturing Center and the Public uh, Safety Education Building both being finished up this year. So this is an unusually large year for um, construction at the college as we wrap up the referendum and we have the the innovative manufacturing, which was being paid for by a gift from our foundation. Um, and then you can see the other ones don't really change a whole lot, except for you'll see student services went from three and a half million to almost 11 and a half. That's again, that's that pass through a financial aid. So that's what that really is. Any questions on how the college spends our, our dollars or how, where we, what sources we have? Yes. Can I just clarify how much are you, it's about 9.6 million this year. Okay. Yeah. Just in debt yes. Yeah. And that's it's partly because of the referendum. Uh, that was a $32 million referendum from uh, 2020. We did finish up the borrowings there. Um, and then the rest of it is we do borrowings for any remodeling project that we do on the campus. So that's um, multiple years. We typically pay those off in 10 years um, with most of those borrowings. Um, so those are being paid off um, each year. Um, so that's our both principal and interest. So it's it's both both sides of that. Um, I, it's up a little bit this year. I think last year, I think this year's 9.6. Last year was in the high 8. Point something, um, pretty pretty high. We do expect this as we projected long term to kind of stay right where we are uh, over the next several years. Uh, we don't expect to jump over that 10 million at this point. We think we'll stay kind of right in this 9.6. So it should stay pretty stable. Um, when I project it out for the next uh, you know, five to seven years. Do you know how much the interest rate, what the interest rate is? And is it well, a lot of our interest rate is really good. Like the, um, okay. the public service building, the interest rate is 2.2%. I mean, we, as a college, because of our taxing authority, uh, we are rated as a double A credit by Moody's, which means 
a really high credit rating, so we get really good interest rates, plus it's tax exempt, exempt borrowing. So um, even with that, we get um, the benefit of being tax exempt. So our interest rates historically have been great. So right now it's been great. The good news is, is we did most of that referendum borrowing when interest rates were really, really low. We actually did our last big 19 million of that in April of 22, which was like the last good chance to do it. Because <laughs> since then, we all know it's gone with interest rates. They've gone straight to the roof. Um, so luckily we've done our big borrowers already, locked them in at super low rates. And as we look forward, that's something we're looking at doing a, a borrowing here in January for um, a remodeling of our district office. We don't expect as good of a rate, but um, we, it's a much smaller borrowing and then we're, we're expecting those rates to moderate. I don't think we'll get back to where we've really been near zero, but uh, like I said, the good news is we locked in the majority of our debt at super low rates. So then do you have your own <coughs> authority or does, or does that run through the state DOA? Uh, we actually, bond, the bonding authority is through us. We don't run through like WEFA or the, like the, the state authorities. Uh, we actually do the, the bonding um, through the college. Um, so there's a process that we go through with resolution, but yes, the bonding is actually done through um, the college authority. Good question. Any other questions? Great questions. So um, now that we talked about where we spend the money, let's talk about some of the things we've, we've done um, over the, the last uh, year um, uh, uh, as we've spent that. I always like to point out this graph because this is, to me, a very powerful graph. Um, uh, this is 2022 data, but what it shows us is what the average earnings of a BTC graduate is compared to different levels of education. So somebody who has, doesn't have a high school education, somebody who has just a high school diploma, um, some college, and then you know, up the line. And you can see our average um, student is earning over $50,000 a year, um, pretty close to $55,000 a year um, uh, with the BTC education. So you compare that to a high school diploma, which is around 33,000, maybe some college or associates at you know, 40, 42. You can see that having a BTC education is a nice uh, positive for our students. It's something that's quickly translatable into the workforce. Uh, I did a little looking at a few of our big, you know, you know, a few of our different programs and said, hey, how long, if you come to our college, you don't have any financial aid, you paid 100% out of pocket, which is actually very rare. Most students do qualify for some level of financial aid. But if you paid for every dollar out of pocket, what's that translate in terms of your, uh, your payback on that investment? I looked at accounting, well, I'm an accountant, I had to look at that one. Um, the fees for an accounting program is about $9,500. Uh, um, if you go through our accounting program, the median salary is about $49,000. So that means you're getting your money back in less than a year compared to if you just had your high school diploma. Uh, you look at our um, nursing program. For our nursing program, so get your RN, about $11,000, uh, actually a little less than that. And a nursing degree, you know, median salary is almost $77,000. So you can see how quickly they're able to take that investment and translate it. I did paramedic tech, which is around 10,000, and the CNC manufacturer around 10,000. You know, both of those are, one's 50, one's 45,000. So I think the message is, is our degrees are not only um, uh, lower cost uh, than what you'd see um, at the university setting, uh, we're also then translating that immediately into good paying, um, jobs for the folks that come to the college. And we're very proud of that. Uh, we admit everyone to our college. Uh, we don't have a selective admissions process. So if you apply, you, you will get in. There may be some need, hey, if you're behind in math, we have uh, accelerated programs. Let's get you caught up in math. Let's get you caught up in your area. But we don't turn folks down um, uh, because of, you know, hey, we competitive process like you would see at a university setting. So it's very inclusive, very accepting to everyone. And then we get those people uh, into jobs that they can uh, translate into uh, positive life, uh, life careers. Uh, some of the highlights, this is one I, I wanted to highlight was our partnership. Uh, we expanded our partnerships to what we call our university center. And this is really exciting to me and we're continuing to work with other colleges seeing how we can continue to connect with them as well. Um, including, I know we've had some discussions with Beloit College. How can we be a partner with our local colleges? We have a formal partnership with um, UW uh, Rock County, uh, with um, Lakeside University and Concordia. 
where you can come to Blackhawk, spend your full four years at Blackhawk in a combination between our classes and classes done um, through the universities, um, get your bachelor's degree and never have to leave campus. Um, it's a really great program. Uh, it allows uh, students to take advantage of our cost uh, uh, for a lot of their credits. We at least half, if not more than half of the credits they can take at Blackhawk. And then the credits that they're taking at these partner uh, institutions, we've, we've worked out how can we make sure that's an affordable way. So we have a great way for a student uh, to come. So if you're an accounting student and you wanna come, we have a partnership with uh, uh, Lakeland is, uh, who does that program. You can come start your program at Blackhawk, continue at Lakeland and ultimately leave uh, with a bachelor's degree at a very affordable cost. So that's something we're really promoting. We're hoping to expand. I think that's a great way uh, for students to, um, uh, um, to bring more students right out of high school into Blackhawk and give them a very good opportunity from a cost perspective um, to get their degree. Another thing that we started offering in the fall of 2022 is an Associates of Arts and Associates of Science degree. Uh, that actually required a state law change to allow us to do that. And those degrees have been very positive. Uh, we've seen a lot of growth. So those are your um, uh, liberal arts degrees where you know more science, more general education, not as directive. Blackhawk up to this point is really directed. You want an accounting program, you want a nursing program, very directed. These allow a little bit more um, uh, opportunities to uh, chart your path as uh, one of our academic people says. Um, so they can do the Associates of Arts, Associates of Science. And then what we've been working on a lot is how do we make sure those are transferable if that student does want to go into a, another four-year university. How do we make sure those credits are being transferred? But you can graduate from Blackhawk. We actually had some of our first graduates uh, last night uh, we had commencement and we had some of our first graduates from our Associates of Arts and Associates of Science program. I think we had four of them that did it in a year and a half. So that's really exciting, something new, and we're really expanding our course offerings. And we've also partnered uh, with UW Rock County to help us provide additional classes that we might not be able to offer at our college yet um, on a dual credit. So those are areas that we, we definitely have partnered with uh, our regional educators to, to do a better job. Can you, can you just tell me, what's the advantage to, for example, Rock County for a student to participate in this partnership? Well, I think it's a couple things. One is it does help uh, bring that student. Maybe the student is looking at their options and they say, well, um, I could go to um, Blackhawk and I might want to you know, do a Blackhawk degree um, in something, you know, like, you know, I would say welding, or uh, that's probably not a great example. I'm trying to have a good example. Maybe I want to start in, in health sciences. Uh, this gives that opportunity for UROC um, to say, hey, you know, here's a way if you want to continue into the sciences, maybe you're not going to go into nursing. Maybe you want to get into more general science. It allows that partnership to come through Blackhawk, start there, and then you started at Blackhawk, you want to go into nursing. Now I've got there and I say, hey, maybe I want to do something else, uh, more general science. I'm connect, I can connect right with uh, UW Rock County and um, have that connection and, and really work right towards that so you can transition right into it. So one of it I think is just having that access to students that you know, are thinking Blackhawk is an option. It gives access um, to continue that degree for the next couple of years. But I have to keep on hitting it. If I talk too long, it, it stops on me. So I think that's one of the advantages is um, they can attract new, new, a new pool of students that maybe they couldn't before. And then also, like I said, because of our model and our cost, a new student coming out of high school might look at the university as just too expensive. If they come through us, it gives them another avenue and a more affordable way to get to that same degree. So I think for that out of high school student, the benefit of partnering with us is it's a more affordable way. You can get somebody who maybe say, I just, I can't do it. Um, where um, with the student who's already at Blackhawk, it gives access to somebody who it changes their mind, you know. 18 years old, if you come to Blackhawk, you might not know exactly where you're gonna end up uh, with your path, and this helps connect those students. So I think there's a lot of benefits for uh, those four-year universities. Because we're not trying to replace them, we're trying to you know, you know, partner with them. Uh, some of the other things, um, this year we did have our um, accreditation, so we, we have the Higher Learning Commission comes in, they do a very extensive process. Um, we did get reaccredited, and we had a very positive report from them, they were very pleased with what we did. Um, so that's a lot of work that goes into that. I started right after they're gone, so for me it was easy. Uh, but the people who were there, it got me a lot of work um, going into that accreditation. And then we continue to see very strong enrollment growth. 
Uh, last year we saw um, strong enrollment growth um, of various programs, particularly our general programs with the Associates of Arts and Associates of Science degrees, and also in our, what we call our MAC division, those are you know, the manufacturing, um, automotive, um, and other technical programs. Uh, this year we continue to see very strong growth. Our fall enrollment was up 4.4% in terms of number of credits and even a higher percentage in terms of number of students. I think the student, I should have wrote it down, I think it was six or seven percent in terms of the number of students coming into Blackhawk. So we've seen a lot of growth over the last three years and are really back to some of the enrollment levels that we haven't seen since the uh, you know, GM closure days um, where we had hit a really high peak, but we've come to some of those, pretty close to some of those levels over the last several years of growth. So that's been a very positive that people are choosing Blackhawk as an option. So a little bit about our construction, uh, what's going on. Like I said the last big phase of our, oh sorry, was there a question? No, 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 no. Okay, sorry. Um, so the last big phase of our um, referendum, the construction uh, of our public safety and education building. So this will bring a new, um, in the basement it has a shooting range and the upper floor has a large gymnasium where they can do the police uh, training and also has a very large apparatus bay where they can do the fire and paramedic training um, all in that building has some educational classrooms in the middle uh, really brings them to the state of our training facility and this connects with the rest of the project that we've been doing for the last three or four years where we have our um, uh, automotive technician building which is right next to it um, you can kind of see it in the back there that's connected to it and that does automotive diesel mechanics those sort of programs we also had built a um, track so we can do truck driving um, and uh, what they call EVOC, so it's the um, teaching of basic driving, so our, you know, police, fire, um, ambulance, if they're, you know, how to make sure that they're safely driving, especially at higher speeds. Um, so that whole facility, this is kind of the last big piece of it. We expect it to open, uh, we're expecting occupancy in the February, March time frame. We'll probably start transitioning classes um, during the semester, but by next fall, when the semester opens, all of our public safety will be over in the new facility. So that's very exciting. Um, and then the other big one that we were able to announce over the summer, and this one we were actually able to do um, through a grant um, uh, and not through uh, um, you know, a, a referendum, but we were actually able, our uh, foundation, they had owned our facility in Milton, uh, the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Center. Um, the college actually had leased that uh, building for a long time uh, from them. They found a buyer for it and were able to sell the building and give a gift to the college to do the construction for our innovative manufacturing center. And what this does is it does a few things. One is it brings that manufacturing center uh, from Milton to a more central location. You know, really our campus is located right in the heart of Rock County, um, so it's much more central to the Rock County population. Um, and it's just as easy to get to if you're coming from Greene County, so it doesn't disadvantage those folks either. Um, the, the facility is gonna be about 30, 5,000 square feet, uh, which is quite a bit smaller than our current building, but what we found is we had this 110,000 square foot building we were leasing and only using 50,000 square feet. Now, in a more efficient model, we're gonna be able to do it in about 33,000 square feet and bring all that manufacturing um, uh, to our central campus. And it does a few things. Like I said, it centralizes for students, but it also brings students to our main campus, so if they have questions, need to meet with, uh, um, uh, financial aid need to meet with an advisor. We have an advisor up in Milton, but now they have the full force of our student services right there on campus because most of them are located at central campus. So it also, you know, brings the student closer to where we can provide the most services for their um, uh, uh, for their uh, continued success. That building is expected to open um, in August um, and be ready for the fall semester. And it's going quick since there's no walls up yet, but <laughs> that's what they're promising. Uh, walls are going up in mid-January. Um, this will also be precast concrete. If you look at the last building, you can kind of see it down here. It will finish off on the edges. There will be like some metal panels on the edges, but that's a precast, so they kind of put the walls up in one piece. And I know I've seen a lot of it on various spots around <laughs> around the county. You can't can't seem to avoid precast concrete, but it's a very quick, efficient way uh, to build the, the facility. So that will be. Uh, like I said, walls going up in January and quite a bit of work then will go into um, completing that building. And then what you can see behind it is our district office. Uh, that was always kind of off by itself. 
for whatever reason. We've moved everyone out of our district office. I'm now in the main building and so is everyone else, uh, President of Human Resources, everyone that was in our district office. And it takes you to connect right to our district office to provide classroom and support services like the dean and the faculty for that math division right there. So it's all gonna be kind of interconnected uh, uh, in the facility. So really great opportunity for them to all come together. So one last tidbit about the college, we have about 196 full-time employees. I looked at last year, I think it's basically the same number as what I saw in the notes from last year's presentation. Uh, so we have stayed pretty consistent. Uh, we do have a lot of part-time uh, employees, uh, about 350, most of those are adjunct professors. So we have a lot of adjunct faculty that um, you know, are teaching one class here, one class there um, as kind of a, a part-time job. So we do have lots of part-time people uh, but that's our full-time staff uh, uh, across campuses. And then just some details in terms of our students and our success rates. Uh, you know, we are very proud of, of our students and, and what they've been able to achieve. Uh, last night at commencement, we had a, one of the students from our IT program uh, who shared his success. He owns um, Superior um, Technology and has really grown that business. Um, and he came through our program worked in a couple industry uh, industries in the area. I know Trent was one of them, Blinky on the other one, uh, but a couple different places and ultimately um, went on to uh, own his own business. So I'm uh, very proud of our student success uh, and what they've been able to accomplish after leaving Blackhawk. Well, that's what I have. Any questions that I can uh, answer? Oops. Yes. So you talked about your connection to universities and, and UROC, you know, UROC and that. Um, how about connections the other way with local high school dual credit programs? Yes, I, I should have brought up. You yeah. Mention that, but, yeah. Um, oh, very good, very good point. Thank you for reminding me. I should have brought that up. Yes, we partner with a lot of uh, local high schools. I think we have, last time I saw, was at least a dozen, if not 15 different local high schools that we, we connect with. And we do it in different ways. Um, for example, I know in our um, mineral, we actually share a lab. Um, so we have the manufacturing lab in the high school. So we use it for our students and then they can use it for their students so we can partner that way. Uh, we also partner with various um, schools um, to bring students up. So a good example of that is in South Beloit, uh, we actually bring students up um, to campus each day um, for um, automotive classes and um, IT classes. Um, we also have a craftsman program which gets sponsored by uh, the um, uh, local uh, manufacturers in Rock County uh, where we partner with high schools uh, where their um, students through the college can actually go out to uh, these manufacturing facilities and, and in essence do an internship with the uh, guidance from the college really being kind of that support connecting the high school students with the, the manufacturers out there. But yeah, we do a lot in terms of those direct connections. We also do something called, um, uh, we have a dual credit class or transcribed opportunities. So a lot of our schools, I know Beloit um, takes uh, part in this, where a high school teacher will actually teach a Black Hawk Tech class. And there's no charge to the student, so they're able to actually teach that class. And that student will get credit um, if they choose to come to Black Hawk or if it's a class that they can get credit behind it. They can get their credits mm -hmm. at Black Hawk um, from the class they're taking in high school. So we work with those teachers, get them set up on our learning structure. They have to meet our credentialing standards. Uh, they have to teach in our learning management tool, um, but they ultimately teach a high school class for free um, that will translate into credit at Black Hawk Tech um, if they choose to come here or other schools, depending on where, where they head off. And that's been a great program. And something we've really rebooted over the last couple of years in terms of making sure that those classes are just as stringent and just as good as the class you get at Black Hawk because we really want that experience to be the same um, there. And then the last one that we really partner closely with is uh, Rock University High School. It's a charter um, high school through the Janesville School District actually on our campus. And we've had students walk out of high school graduation and then walk in um, their Black Hawk Tech graduation with their associate's degree. Um, so they're able to go through. So the high school is actually located on our central campus um, and the students are able to take high school <laughs> classes taught by um, district employees and then come right, you know, they're on campus, they can come over and have a class. So if one of them was, you know, wanting to get their associates in accounting, they could come and actually take my class um, as part of their uh, high school uh, program at no charge to that student. So yeah, partnering with our um, high schools is extremely important. 
Um, that's a great area where we can provide a lot of uh, um, uh, benefit to the student and get them those credits before they have to actually start paying for them. And I'd say the other thing that we do a lot of that I didn't mention that kind of reminded me of it was we really try to partner with local uh, manufacturers and those partners in the area that, that can, or businesses, not just manufacturers, but businesses of any kind, um, so that we can work with them and partner to either do apprenticeship programs. We do a lot of apprenticeship programs, particularly when you get into some other things like CNC uh, manufacturing. You know, somebody, they're hiring somebody, they don't have that skill, but they can't find anyone that has it, so they're hiring somebody that doesn't, they'll send them over to Blackhawk um, and, and do that. And we also manage apprenticeship programs with uh, in some of those professions that need it. So um, we definitely want to partner as much as we can with the community. And I, I think that's one of the areas we've really grown over the last five to six years. I've been, like I said, on the foundation, I was on the foundation until I took this job for 12, 13 years back. And that's something that I, I think, um, you know, as I've seen the last five, six years, we've really done a much better job of. Yeah. Great question. Thanks for reminding me. I would have missed a really good point. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the administration building. It reminded me of there were conversations around daycare for students, uh, maybe using that space, but where's that conversation gone? You know, I, I don't think that's an area where we'll be doing it as a college. Uh, we, we did it a long time ago. Uh, it was something they tried to manage. It just wasn't successful for our skill set as a college. Uh, we've looked at areas, could we partner with somebody to try to come up with a solution? We haven't come up with, we haven't left it as, as not a, not a ever, but us running the daycare, I, I don't think is where we can best use our skills. Um, that's not really our, our talent. But, you know, we, we had, you know, you know, is there a way that we can partner some way somehow to provide that? Because like you said, daycare for students is, is a challenge. And, and that's why like we talk about how do we support our students who are in all different points in their life. And a student that has a, hey, my, my babysitter just canceled. I can't come to class. It'd be great to have an on-demand option. We don't think we can provide that option as a college at this point. Um, and uh, and we don't have a great option, but something we, we are always trying to figure out, how can we do a better job? Because it is just one more of those things. We're, we're pretty good at, hey, my car broke down, I have no money, I can't really come to college. Hey, we have a program to help that person out, give them some emergency funding to, to deal with that car issue. But the child issue is a much, the child care issue is a much bigger challenge. Yes. Um, yeah, child care is, is a huge challenge. I don't know that. <laughs> You're, you're doing a lot already. Um, so thank you for the fantastic presentation. I I know that you serve so many different groups. Um, you know, maybe taking the high schoolers out of the equation, you know, what, what would you say is the average age of the student that you serve? Is it like slightly, is it- I believe, and, and I'll, I'll tell you if I'm wrong, I, I apologize. I believe yeah. it's in that mid 20s is mid -20s. where our, okay. our kind of that is. So, like you said, there's a, a portion that are right out of high school. There's a portion that are much later in their career that are, you know, maybe retraining or, or something like that. But I'd say where we get a lot of our students, um, you know, if they're not going into some of the, uh, you know, they maybe started uh, working at a, a business and they're doing uh, accounting, accounts payable and they want to move up. So they come to our accounting program or they start at a manufacturer, maybe they're just unskilled labor at a, and a manufacturer, you know, work in the warehouse and hey, I want to learn how to do, you know, something more to advance it. So we get a lot of those students who start, you know, they're not really sure where they want to go, and yeah. then they come back to us. And that's kind of mid 20s sweet spot. Um, I know when I looked at graduation, I'd say that last night, that's where the majority of them are probably fell right in the mid 20s. But we definitely have uh, returning students, students who've done one thing for 20 years and said, you know, I, I want to do something more. Uh, we had a nursing student last night who, um, I won't guess her age, but was definitely um, beyond our average student age, but was so excited because I, I believe her story was she was a, a, a working in a, a hospital as like an MA or something and then decided to go back and get a nursing degree much later in life. I'm not a thousand percent sure, but that's what I believe I, I, that's what I was told. But again, I think the message is, you know, yeah, most of them are, you know, in that mid twenties, but it varies. You'll have a student right out of high school to a student who's, you know, in there, you know, looking at a second career or, or retraining or, or finally deciding my kids are out of the house, I can I can do something uh, for myself. And what level of student debt are they leaving with? Are Mostly with very little. Um, uh, most of our students do qualify for financial aid. Um, as you see, our programs typically are, you know, $10,000 or less um, to get through the entire program. 
So most of our students with financial aid are leaving with almost no debt. Um, and those who are, um, it's, it is pretty minimal in terms of the debt that they're gonna absorb. Uh, because like I said, between the financial aid and then like, for us, our, our tuition rates are set by the state. I think it's $146 a credit, I believe is the, uh, the last number. So it is a very um, uh, low, low number. Um, so we are very excited that most of our students walk out the door debt free. I just, I just think it's really interesting that you were positioned for online and that flexibility and then the pandemic hit so you did really well for this on behalf of the students that way yes and yet as that lets up you didn't say you know what it's all digital now we're all going all in on that is that you recognize the desire because we see it here too the desire for that in-person in-person programming and all that and then you so you were there when that hit well positioned but now you're, you're just moving forward with in-person presence as well. Yeah, it is really hard when it comes to um, that that debate because there's that can I can I force the students to come for like two weeks or can they you know make them prove that they can do it online because we do see such higher success when they're here and we have to fight that instinct and really like I said what what Dr. Pierner has consistently said is the goal is to um, have them choose the online uh, the in-person option as much as possible rather than forcing that in any way. And there's clearly exceptions to that. It's hard to teach welding without you being in person. Um, but there are other things that we're able to, to do that. Do the students in the class know each other? I'm just wondering, you know, what's the... It, it depends. Uh, the yeah. ones in person definitely do. A lot of them are the ones who show up in person and they have lots of classes together. And I, I'll tell you, when I, you know, I, about five students that were consistently showing up to my classes last semester, and a couple of them would talk about another class that they're in together. I think online, if they're showing up live online, they do, some of our classes are very collaborative. Now mine doesn't have a lot of collaboration in it, but a lot of our classes are very collaborative in terms of the project. So even if they're not in person physically meeting each other, they are um, connecting through the, uh, the collaborative work. So there is definitely a push to do that. But I'd say the ones who are on campus definitely have a, a stronger relationship with others than the ones who are solely taking it as, as an online course um, and are, are simply you know, off. And there's some students who are on campus some days uh, because in our model, you don't have to choose. So you can literally come to my class on Monday, watch it live online on Wednesday, and then the next week you're out of town, don't do anything, just do it as an online class. So, it's not like you're choosing which option you're doing at any point in time. You, you, you choose it based on what that day is. And I've had students, I always tell my live students, if you're not gonna show up, can you just shoot me an email so I don't wonder what happened to you? <laughs> and so I'll get, oh, sorry, I you know, had, you know, had car trouble, not gonna make the class, I'll watch the video later. You know? and, and so it isn't a, a choice they have to make. So yeah, I think trying to get them more collaborative, but again, that's where that, that in person, you know, being able to, to run into each other is so so valuable. Well, on that too, as you said, there's five to six in a classroom. Some of that happens naturally, but your cohort structure. So my daughter's in the sonogram program, yeah. ultrasounds and yeah. that, and her cohort just had a party out in Elkhorn, one of their cohorts' house, yeah. and so they built that. Really, and yet they still do the online when needed, or you know, they they take advantage of the other options as well. But it certainly has built. That, that relationship. Yeah, so, 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 nice what, so those of you don't may, maybe know what a cohort is, is there are certain programs that are, you know, some programs are very flexible in terms of where you can take classes when you can, uh, and some are very, you kind of have to build your way through it. And nursing is a good example, sonogram is a good example, dental is a good example. So in those areas where you have to do that, is you do, we do create a cohort, and we can take so many students. I'll say some of those are very in demand, so there's actually, you know, like I said, anyone can come to the college, but to get into some of those programs, you have to actually, what we call petition to get into them. We try to have as much you know, access as possible, but they'll say, okay, we, we, we have a 10 person cohort. So they fill that up with 10 students and those 10 students will stay together. Every class will be the same for two years as they go through the program. So it's a very consistent process. And like you said, um, Nick, that yes, uh, even if they're online or not, they have some level of 
you know, they, typically those are in areas where you have some level of physical interaction as well. So you do see them, but then you also know that they're online. And so we see that a lot in the health sciences area or the allied health areas, you know, so dental and radiography, nursing. We also see that um, in some of the MAT programs um, uh, that have cohorts like uh, the EPD program, for example, that's our electrical power distribution. So linemen, you know, that's a very, you, know, you kind of go through the process as a group um, together because it is very structured on how you have to get from not knowing anything to knowing how to be in linemen. There's a very structured process uh, where, you know, some of the other ones like if you're in business management, if I take accounting first or if I take, you know, you know digital marketing, you know, it, I, I can do it in various orders and get to the same end point. But yeah, the cohorts are very good for, for connecting those students.